Jesus, and now he's coming, and now is coming to an end. And almost half of the project duration has been under some sort of some form of COVID restrictions. And there were many different impacts of COVID on the project. And one of them was for us not being able to run the final project meeting of all the partners and stakeholders in the Western Indian Ocean. So to try to compensate for lack of such a meeting, we put together a final solstice webinar series, which will run now for four weeks, four Mondays through November, and will cover all the key aspects of the project. And today's seminar is dedicated to the research uh, done for the North Kenyan Bank. You will hear a wide range of presentations, um, starting from scientific results uh, to online lectures, sample online lectures, and to policy and management implications. So please post your questions uh, in the Q&A box. Uh, and the question and answer session today will be chaired by Fatma Jebri, one of our solstice early career researchers and an expert on remote sensing. So many thanks again for joining us and welcome to the webinar. Uh, so agenda uh, is almost uh, unchanged uh, from what you saw online. It is on the screen right now. And unfortunately, uh, Mike Roberts cannot join us. So I will have to start with the launch of a special issue of the Austal Econ uh, and Coastal Management Journal, which is entitled East African Coastal Current Ecosystems at the Frontier of Climate Change and Food Security. This is one of the core deliverable of Solstice project. It is of 13 papers, uh, and it's a result of international collaboration of 79 authors. We're very proud to say that seven uh, papers in this uh, special issue are led by African researchers, and three papers are led by African early career scientists. So on the right of the screen, you see a very strange map of the world. So there are different ways of putting uh, countries uh, on a map. Most common is presenting the areas to geographical areas, but this map shows areas of the countries in proportion to research publication. This map was used in the strategy of the oceans decade 2030, the signs we need for the ocean we want. So by launching this special uh, issue, we're very proud to say that we made a step towards improving representations of African researchers in uh, Linden International Journals in peer review literature. So I will pass a microphone now to Stuart Painter, who was our editor of the special issue to give us to give you an introduction to the special issue content. Thank you. Hello, I'm Stuart Painter. I'm based at the UK's National Oceanography Centre. I'm one of the scientists that's involved with the Solstice project. Um, I've also had the privilege of acting as one of the guest editors for the special issue, which is one of the major science outputs from the Solstice project. So I'd like to give you a sort of introduction to that, if I may. The outputs from the Solstice project cover a wide range of topics, ranging from physical sciences through to social sciences. And this presented some difficulty to us quite early on in identifying a journal that would host. The papers broadly group or can be grouped under five headings or topics. So we have papers that look at fisheries and coastal communities. These particular papers focus on the emerging fisheries of the North Kenya banks. Um, and the underlying productivity drivers driving those fisheries. We have um, 
paper which looks at the small pelagic fishery of Pemba Channel and its susceptibility to climate change. We also have papers that are looking at the capacity of communities to adapt to changes in local fisheries. And what this has found is that the poorer fishers are more likely to struggle to adapt compared to their richer counterparts. And this is due to um, uh, reliance upon fewer target fish species by poorer fishers. Next, we have papers on mesophotic and deep water habitats. And this includes the first autonomous underwater vehicle survey of mesophotic coral reefs from the Western Indian Ocean region. We also have a paper that's uh, based on remotely operated vehicle surveys of deep water habitats. So we're talking down to depths of about 4,000 meters. And it also includes the canyon systems along the continental shelf of, of Tanzania. Um, as an example of the sorts of things that you can see from, uh, from the ROV, I have here some images at the bottom. So not only do you see plenty of weird and wonderful organisms living on the seabed, you can actually see in, in the middle here, uh, the remains of a dugout canoe, which was found at a depth of about 1300 meters. So that nicely um, illustrates the connectivity between the shallow waters where most of the fishing is done and the deep off, sh off um, shelf areas. We also have papers on the oceanography and biogeochemistry of the waters along Kenya and Tanzania. These are really looking at some of the impacts of upwelling or the regional circulation on the distribution of chemical and biological properties. Uh, thus, they really provide the sort of links from physics to fish, which, which many people are interested in. So as an example, I have here in the middle, just uh, two images. The top one shows you the sea surface temperature map. And if you look closely, you can see this um, sort of nice low temperature signal at the surface, which corresponds with this region of high nitrate. So it gives you an indication that there's a physical mechanism there supplying nutrients to the surface ocean. Um, we also have a number of papers which are looking at or which utilize marine robotics. And at the bottom here, are a series of photos showing the deployment or the recovery of those vehicles. Now, I mentioned uh, use of an AUV in the mesophotic coral surveys, but we also deploy gliders. And as part of this, much effort was put into evaluating how coastal communities would respond to a chance encounter with a glider. The results of this were quite surprising. Um, some individuals held deep suspicions that such, ten, uh, such technologies were spying on them or monitoring their, their fishing efforts. Others were more curious, but largely indifferent. So a key conclusion of this study was that successful deployment of autonomous platforms would benefit enormously from um, engagement and efforts to raise awareness within local communities before deployments themselves were undertaken. Finally, we have a series of papers which are looking at um, the uh, impacts of climate change and what this may mean for some of the region's fisheries. The, the broad conclusions from this indicate warmer, less productive waters throughout the 21st century and a corresponding reduction in the fisheries potential. Such results um, indicate the magnitude of some of the challenges ahead and emphasize the importance of continued investment in marine science. And uh, whilst there remain many uncertainties, there are two areas where the data can be of immediate use. Um, firstly, we have um, efforts to adapt to or plan for the impacts of climate change. So the key impacts, as I've just said, are reduced marine productivity and temperature reduced migration of uh, key fish species and or the degradation of key habitats. Um, so climate change impacts need to be fully integrated into strategic plans for marine food security, blue economy and fisheries policies. Now, these are not new, uh, not new conclusions. These have been said many times before. But we have data now to really sort of support those um, changes. And secondly, um, the issue of fisheries management. It's quite clear that um, there are different challenges facing both Kenya and Tanzania. In Kenya, for example, there is a window of opportunity to develop and implement a management plan and policies um, to ensure the sustainable development of the emerging fisheries of the North Kenya Bank region. And this is largely due to the fact that blue economy initiatives which are driving 
the exploitation of the fisheries in this region, lead the ability of the fishing communities at the moment to access those waters. But that window, however, will close. In Tanzania, um, the challenges are very different. There's a very complex legislative arena in Tanzania. Um, with a shared fisheries resource between mainland Tanzania and Zanzibar, for instance. So steps towards joint collaborative management arrangements via coordination activities um, can be undertaken at the moment. And we are beginning to see sort of the benefits of that within some of the data that we report in these papers. And uh, I will simply conclude by saying that if you haven't yet read the papers or if you were not aware of the special issue, um, all papers are free to access and uh, Put the, the link there on the screen. Um, so I'd encourage you to go and have a look at those papers. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we now get like five minutes for questions. Um, in the QA, um, it looks like we do not have yet questions from our participant. Is there um, um, anyone with a question from the panelists or the attendees? Otherwise, I'd like to maybe start with a question. So I actually have a question um, for Stuart about the special issue. It looks like um, the marine technology had like a a big impact in um, getting with the finding and um, the results um, from the, uh, the different scientific results in the special issue. Um, how, um, how this would fit into um, like the um, future uh, management um, uh, requirements? Certainly, I think there's a tremendous um, interest across the region for new technologies um, and also existing technologies. Uh, I think we've we've tried to demonstrate the sort of usefulness of those technologies, certainly in, in terms of gliders. Um, but we've also demonstrated perhaps the steep learning curve that is associated with some of these technologies. So I, I think there is a, a very good future there for a lot of these technologies, such as gliders. Um, maybe some more um, uh, traditional techniques like ocean modeling, remote sensing. I think there's a huge appetite for that. Um, in terms of how, how these are integrated into sort of management plans going forward, I think that's, that's very much something that will be led by individual institutions and researchers in response to um, the management requirements. Right. Um, so from the chat, it seems that there is no link to Q&A. Okay. Um, right. There's also, I think, a little bit of technical issues with the presentation being blurry. Um, yeah. I, I see Melita's comment there about the, the link to the special issue, so I'll post that in a second. Right. Um, is there any other questions? Um, if if attendees have questions, if the if they can't get into the Q and A, if we could type them into the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, we we actually have a question now from Melita. So she, Melita is asking regarding the impact of the research on management. It seems this was easier on the North Kenyan banks. Can you be more specific? Um, I mean, that may be a question for Joseph, but from my perspective, I think the. Uh, it came across as an easier proposition in Kenya because there is currently no management plan that covers vast areas of the North Kenya bank. So it's easier to propose um, sort of how, how that should be devised or how that could be devised. In, in Tanzania, there are already existing management plans and a, a more complex sort of legislative arena. So it's, um, it's harder to propose things that are sort of acceptable across the board in, in those areas. And it's not really our place to be suggesting things. We can provide the data, but it, it really kind of addresses or links to um, different, which we say different levels of sort of management um, that currently exist in, in the two areas. Thanks. Um, Hello. Yeah. Go ahead, Joseph. 
Yeah, maybe first we need to fix uh, that technicality because uh, I, I presume everybody is getting, uh, I mean, complications in joining. Uh, yeah, they, they need to revisit all those that were sent the link, they, they are sent the proper link so that it can join in the webinar. And I understand, I, I just talked to uh, Mike, he's also having the same problem, he didn't have uh, a link to join in with. Okay, uh, well, we'll try and fix this. <laughs> I'm emailing the um, events team at the minute um, to try and fix that. Hi, Amani. Just to let people know, um, uh, there was one person who was trying to log in as a presenter with the wrong email address. So if people can make sure they log in with the email address that they gave us when they registered, that would be absolutely fantastic. Okay, uh, is there any questions uh, regarding uh, the two presentations that we just had from Katya and Stuart? Um, okay, I don't see any hands up or questions in the Q&A. Um, if we got everything covered, maybe, I don't know, Amani, should we move to the next uh, presentation or should we give it like bit more minutes. So the next presentation is, um, is from the MOOC, so it's an introduction to the North Kenya banks. So I will just play that now and hopefully people will continue to be able to join. Okay. Thanks. In this lecture, we will introduce you to the Kenyan marine fisheries, to the challenges facing Kenyan artisanal fishermen, to the economic potential of the North Kenya banks, and to the research questions which need urgent answers in order to make the exploitation of this new emergent resource sustainable in the face of the growing threat of climate change. This lecture was written by Dr. Joseph Kamal, a senior scientist at the Kenyan Marine Fisheries Research Institute and an expert in oceanography and sustainable development of living marine resources. On Africa's Indian Ocean coast, just south of the equator, lies the Kenyan coastline. It is home to millions of people who are culturally and spiritually linked to the ocean. A rapidly growing population on the Kenyan coast relies heavily on marine resources for food and income which puts a lot of the marine ecosystem in danger of over-exploitation. In 2016, the marine fisheries sector employed about 27,000 fishers, 13,000 of which were artisanal. The number of people supported indirectly by the sector as traders, processors, input suppliers, merchants of fishing accessories or providers of related services is considered much higher. The fisheries sector is critically important not only for food security of the coastal population, but also for the preservation of culture and national heritage, including related industries such as tourism and for recreational purposes. Kenya's marine fisheries are mostly artisanal and subsistence in nature. It is estimated that approximately 80% of the total marine products come from coastal waters and reefs, and only 20% is from offshore fishing. The artisanal fishing boats are small and propelled by sails, outboard motors and paddles. As such, artisanal fishers are mostly restricted to reefs, estuaries and lagoons and nearshore waters, which are now being exploited beyond a sustainable level. Offshore fisheries, on the other hand, remain largely underexploited, at least by the local fishers. And yet just off the Kenyan coast in the vicinity of Lamu lies the North Kenya banks, a shallow expansion of the otherwise very narrow continental shelf. This is a highly productive area which sustains a rich and diverse ecosystem and is seen by the Kenyan government as the new frontier of food security for the growing Kenyan population. Here is the Lamu County Fisheries Chief Officer speaking about the country's ambition to empower local fishermen to unlock the potential of the North Kenya banks. So our plan are one. We need to increase production. We need to increase production and increase production and productivity of our waters. Then it means that we have to access 
where the fish is. You have to access the fishing grounds. And accessing the fishing grounds, meaning we have to modernize our fishing fleet. This now calls for, one, improving our boat building industry. Procuring engines so that we can mechanize our boats. We have procured, procured over 200 uh, uh, outboard engines, fishing lines, snow calls, GPSs, which will enable the fishermen to access those grounds. Because this country, we need to be uh, food secure and fish is part of that food. But can we like now realize the economies? We can have a living. Can we see employment in the fishery sector? Can we see money in the fishery sector? Can people actually embrace fishing and say, this is an occupation even better than the other occupations people have been thinking about? The North Kenya Bank's fishery resource is not a new discovery. Its productivity potential was highlighted back in 1959 in the letter to the editors of the world leading scientific journal, Nature. A bank off the northern Kenya coast is acquiring significance. Its presence is unique along the coastline of tropical East Africa and it is of considerable interest as an abstract marine problem of this region and as a likely boost to local fishery resources. In spite of this early discovery, very little is still known scientifically about the North Kenya Bank's ecosystem, about environmental factors which control its high productivity and how the accelerating impact of climate change may alter its dynamics. Many factors have conspired here. Kenya's turbulent history has limited research by local scientists, while issues of maritime security and risk of piracy from adjacent Somali waters slowed down international research expeditions to these waters. Additionally, the proximity of the famous Somali upwelling, a much more pronounced dynamic feature, has distracted the attention of international modelling and remote sensing research communities. However, research interest on the North Kenya banks is rising on the agenda. The Government of Kenya recognises the value of its marine resources and the need for more effective management and protection. It identifies the agriculture, livestock and fisheries sector as a priority sector and highlights the importance of the country's marine resources and fisheries for local employment, income generation and livelihoods of coastal communities. Sustainable exploitation requires a solid knowledge base about the marine environment and the scientific challenge, in the case of the North Kenya banks, is considerable. The North Kenya Banks is influenced by two powerful ocean currents, the Somali Current and the East African Coastal Current. Under the influence of the East African Monsoon, the Somali Current reverses its direction twice a year. For a few months each year, its path collides with the East African Coastal Current. Both currents deflect away from the coast, causing a strong but highly variable and short-lived upwelling system, bringing waters rich in nutrients to the ocean surface and initiating massive blooms of the phytoplankton, which lies at the base of all marine food webs. Of crucial importance is whether this upwelling is the key feature sustaining the rich ecosystem of the North Kenya banks, or whether the input of nutrients and organic matter from the powerful Tana River is key. Of equal importance is whether this upwelling system changes from year to year and does it always occur at the same place. Does this feature sustain both the breeding and feeding grounds of the main commercially important fish species or is it mainly migratory fish species which come here for the rich feeding grounds? What will be the impact of climate change on the upwelling, on the key fish species and on the plankton which sustain the local food webs? These are the questions which the scientific community begin to address and which we will cover in the next lectures. So um, that uh, lecture was from our MOOC, our um, massive open online course, uh, which is available through Future Learn. And um, I'll put a link into the chat where people can, um, can access the MOOC. It's a four-week a four course. There are over 30 videos, um, video lectures uh, for people to watch. It takes a few hours a week of study. Um, and it is, is a really great, amazing free resource. So I'll share that link with you in the chat. Um, our next presentation is from uh, Joseph Camus from the um, Kenyan Marine Fisheries Institute. Um, I'll share his video and then there'll be a chance to ask him any questions.
Um, my name is uh, Dr. Joseph Kamal from the Human Resources Research Institute. I'll be presenting uh, on the North Kenya Bank's ecosystem productivity, looking into the past, present, and future. Uh, monsoon, the, the, the North, the, an overview of the North Kenya Bank's uh, productivity system so that we can understand. Uh, how this system behaves and what is really uh, enhancing or driving this system. So the system has, um, the monsoon variability has a clear impact on the whole of uh, the Rio region. And the, so North Kenya Bank is not, uh, uh, is, 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 is also affected by this monsoon vari variability. The variability is normally during the Northeast monsoon and the Southeast monsoon. During the Northeast monsoon, the NKD topography causes the eastward deflection of the ESCC. Uh, and uh, mainly when the meridional flow velocity drops beneath uh, 0 0.6. Uh, however, when it exceeds that, then it moves further north to meet with this, uh, the Somali currents and the confluence surface further, further north. In particular, very little work has been done on the variability of the strength or positioning of the confluence during the uh, between the ESCC and the Southeast Monsoon, uh, I mean, Somali current. However, during the Southeast Monsoon, the ESCC continues northwards uh, pro, uh, uh, as, as the Somali current uh, 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 changes and moves uh, northwards. And that's why the, the ESCC continues northwards and crosses towards Somali with speeds exceeding three meters per second, transporting enormous volumes of waters. Uh, understanding this variability is therefore a crucial aspect in supporting the evaluation of the emergent, the evolution of the emergent uh, North Kenya Bank fishery. And this will actually uh, put uh, pointers on uh, uh, the, the lava dispersal as well as the productivity over time, what really drives this system and, and enable us to come up with a sustainable management plan. So having said that, uh, so much research has been done and uh, climatological trends over the North Kenya banks. Uh, uh, over a, a, an extensive period from 1993 to 2015. So modeling that, we, we see that uh, the average, uh, the average climatological trends, uh, looking at uh, productivity, uh, the amount of carbon generated uh, by productivity within these regions, it shows that we are always having a high signature, a high signature over the North Kenya banks and a high signature over the Malindi banks. Uh, so irrespective of uh, whether it's a strong event, upwelling years or weak upwelling years, we still have a, 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 a significant signature over the North Kenya banks and the Malindi banks. Uh, as can be seen on uh, this plot C, where we're looking at uh, weak years, we're still having a signature around the North Kenya banks and around the Malindi banks. Uh, however, when it comes to strong years, the strong years seems to uh, uh, show some overflow northwards of uh, this high signature. So uh, it will be uh, uh, good to understand uh, what happens during these strong years is the confluence moving northwards, and that's why it's spilling over the north or what is happening. So those are kind of research questions that needs to be begs to be answered. There's always some level of productivity, as I've, as I've said, along the north, I mean, uh, along the, uh, the banks. So looking into the past trends to understand the behavior of the confluence zone. So uh, now looking at the Kedo average of S sea surface temperatures and chlorophyll a during the northeast monsoon because uh, the, the variation is uh, mainly occurs uh, because of the shifting of the confluence. So, and the confluence happens during the northeast monsoon. Uh, distinctly cold waters exist north of uh, uh, the four degrees south, uh, south uh, uh, latitude. Uh, However, there is a concentrated, uh, they are concentrated, uh, the cold waters are concentrated near the Kenyan coast. Uh, this is uh, related to wind driven coastal upwelling from the northern winds that prevail during the northeast monsoon, which leads to offshore ecumen transport. 
the killer shows are large scale that are continue operated with colder, more productive waters north of uh, North Kenya banks and warmer, less productive waters south of the North Kenya banks. However, it also shows high chlorophyll concentrations of up to one milligram per meter cubed over the North Kenya banks. So we, uh, further extending the, the argument that we have had in the previous slide that uh, there, are, there is an enhanced uh, productivity over the North Kenya banks over the North Kenya banks, and this uh, may be attributed to the topographical forcing of the North Kenya banks, as well as the Malindi banks. So what is the current uh, productivity trends at, the next, uh, at, at this next uh, fishery frontier? So as previously said, this, uh, North, the North Kenya banks have been laying within uh, the Rio region is actually affected by the Northeast monsoon influenced by, rather by the Northeast monsoon and the Southeast monsoon. Uh, we, because we are focusing on uh, the fishery, looking at uh, scenarios during this period, we have seen that uh, during the Southeast monsoon, and this is in 19, uh, 20, uh, 2020, uh, we, we saw our, our pitching of fish, uh, uh, the small pelagics as well as, well as uh, the predators. The, there was a beaching at, uh, along Malindi during the Southeast monsoon. So you can see that the productivity is through the year. And uh, when looking at the Northeast monsoon, there was a high catch in 19, uh, 2019 at Lamu of China fishery. But the, the, the look side of this is that uh, much of this catch was wasted because of uh, not having a market for this. So there is actually called for the government to come up with an end-to-end -end, uh, market, market strategy so that uh, there is a marketing strategy such that whatever volumes of fish are uh, actually uh, have a, a, a place to be taken to. But already the government is coming up with something that is uh, towards this end. Uh, we have the marketing, uh, there is uh, an institution, institution that have been put in place and a seaport, so this will not be a problem into the future. The complexity as previously stated of the North Kenya Bank ecosystem is what actually makes this system very peculiar. Uh, the system having lying within uh, the coastal zone, I mean, uh, near the uh, near shore within the coast, it is influenced by the Tana River uh, discharge, which uh, Tana River has been shown to discharge about Six million, seven million tons of sediment every year, and that system also in around Lamu has a rich mangrove ecosystem. I mean, forest, which also uh, points at uh, its suitability for the North Kenya Bank as a fishery breeding ground, as can be seen from uh, research that has been conducted. Because we have seen, uh, we have sampled quite a number of uh, larvae, fish larvae within this ecosystem, and that seems to state that the system is quite uh, uh, of importance to us sustaining this fishery. Uh, we also have some deep sea canyons, deep sea canyons uh, uh, around this area. And the deep sea canyons could also be forming as a reservoir for nutrients. And uh, when this perturbation effect, events happen, strong perturbation events happen, there could be uh, an, an event of uh, replenishing these nutrients into the water column and that's uh, enhancing productivity over the years. So having said that, we need to look into the future productive trends of the North Kenya banks. Uh, as previously stated, uh, the, the bank may not, might not be uh, critically affected into the future irrespective of uh, climate scenarios uh, because it, it actually has the, enabled itself to regenerate itself due to its topographical topographic uh, forcing. However, there has been some research that has been conducted over the, the Western Indian Ocean showing that it's warming uh, at, with the onset of climate change with evidence indicating less ocean productivity over the region of the wheel. This implies a reduction in fish stocks. In contrast, however, a recent paper by De Castro et al. indicated that the Somalia aquatic system on the northern border will strengthen over the next century, increasing productivity. This However, needs uh, remains to be seen whether the same will be uh, over the, the area north of Kenya, that's within the North Kenya banks, while we could be affected by, by this uh, finding. 
However, the ecosystem of the North Kenya banks will respond is uh, we are, we are, uh, is currently uncertain how it will respond is currently uncertain, but is of great importance due to significance of associated uh, coastal fishery resources to the coastal community. Uh, however, regardless of regional circulation models and the greenhouse warming scenario, a significant aquatic increase ranging from, uh, as indicated in, in the slide, has been projected to happen over the Somali aquatic ecosystem along the 20th uh, 20, 21st century. That's changing in coastal aquarium project for 21st century, I mainly due to Ekman transport. So uh, still begs for an answer. How will these uh, projected uh, scenarios affect uh, uh, the North Kenya banks? Uh, projected air sea, it has been seen that uh, a land air sea temperature and air, air, uh, air pressure differences along the 21st century. So a clear intensification as a consequence of global warming. This intensification has a strong influence on coastal upwelling uh, strengthening. So this is another uh, phenomenon that uh, needs to be understood on how it will affect the North Kenya banks. The most direct implication of coastal upwelling strengthening is the projected near shore SSD warming with less intense than at the adjacent ocean, especially at the latitude where changes in upwelling are projected to be more intense. So these, these are, uh, our researches that have been conducted. Uh, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you to Joseph for that, that video. Um, are there any questions about that video? Uh, Joseph is here on the panel to answer them. I see that there's been some problems with the video quality. Um, unfortunately, because of the way I have to send these, I can't see your messages as I'm playing the videos. Um, but I will make the, the presentations available online through the Solstice um, website afterwards, if you want to rewatch them and be able to see um, some, of the, some of the detail in the video again. Amani, I cannot post the question because I'm on the panel, but if we don't have any other questions, I would like to ask Joseph. Um, Joseph, so um, quite a lot of publications uh, on North Kenyan Bank uh, now happen over past 12 months. Do we begin uh, to see management, government, other policy-making structures uh, talking about North Kenyan Bank and do we see some of our outputs influencing these discussions? Yes, yes, I can attest to that. There, there has been uh, quite a bit of interest on the same and uh, maybe also aware about uh, the process that we have on uh, coming up with a policy brief that we intend to share widely. So, so I think that will generate, and of course, uh, with the contribution that we had was the, because the policy brief encompasses much of the research that has been done during the Solstice uh, project. So that, that will significantly uh, 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 bring shed light to the processes as well as the importance of this uh, important uh, fishery uh, site. Great, thank you, Joseph. Money. If we don't have more questions, maybe we will bring forward the next presentation uh, on uh, Zoe, Zoe Jacobs' one before the break. Yeah, before the break. Yeah, okay. I'll just line that one up then.
Hello, I am Dr. Sarija. Okay, so I will just share my screen um, for the next presentation. Hello, I am Dr. Zoe Jacobs, and I'm going to talk about the importance of upwelling for productivity over the North Kenya banks. As we've just learned from the previous presentation, the North Kenya banks are a highly productive area found adjacent to Unwana Bay at around three degrees uh, south, and are also home to a diverse marine ecosystem. To fulfil the government's ambition to expand the blue economy, the emerging offshore fisheries of the North Kenya banks are key. The productivity in this region is caused by a seasonal upwelling, so it's vital to understand what drives this upwelling and ascertain how variable it is in terms of strength, location and spatial extent to ensure sustainable management of this new, um, this new emergent resource. So what does drive the upwelling of the North Kenya Banks? It all comes down to the changes in monsoonal winds. So the North Kenya Banks sit in quite a complex region um, in the Western Indian Ocean with considerable monsoonal variability. So during the southeast monsoon from May to September, which is the middle plot here, the East African coastal current and Somali current are fast northward flowing currents along the East African coast in line with the strong winds that flow towards the uh, northwest. During the northeast monsoon from December to February, which is the left plot now, the East African coastal current is still northward, but now much slower. Um, and the Somali current actually reverses to flow southward due to a reversal of the winds, which now flow towards the southwest. The two currents meet near the North Kenya Banks to form a confluence zone, where they then merge and flow eastwards away from the coast, which initiates the upwelling of deeper water to the surface. This um, on the right is a zoom in over the North Kenya Banks, which is marked by the 200 meter isobath that sticks out from the coast. And as you will see, is the site of this upwelling during the Northeast monsoon. Here's an example of a particularly strong upwelling event in February 1997, seen in a high resolution ocean model. You can see evidence of upwelling at the surface with cool SSTs, um, sea surface temperatures, and high chlorophyll concentrations, which is an indicator of productivity over the North Kenya banks. You can also see the confluence of the East African coastal current and Somali current occurs very close to the North Kenya banks at about three and a half degrees south. Um, so this diagram at the bottom right summarises the process uh, whereby the currents meet at a confluence zone uh, near the North Kenya banks. They then flow away from the coast, initiating the upwelling of cool, nutrient-rich water uh, from greater depth to the surface, leading to high productivity uh, capable of sustaining fisheries. As the Somali current only flows southward during the northeast monsoon, so from December to February, uh, the confluence of the currents and therefore the upwelling only occur during this period, which is most commonly in January or February. It generally occurs every year, um, with one exception, during early 1998, during a strong um, El Nino and positive Indian Ocean dipole event. Um, but there is quite a lot of variability in terms of the strength, location and exact timing of the upwelling. So the plot on the left shows the spatial extent of the upwelling during particularly strong um, events, which is defined by a primary production contour of 1.3 grams of carbon per meter squared per day. Um, so you can see that they vary in size um, and position from year to year, but they are all rooted to the North Kenya banks, which is the light grey shade. Um, so the strength can vary quite a lot as well, uh, which can be seen on the bar chart here which shows uh, the integrated phytoplankton biomass within each of those contours um, for each of the years. So the colours um, are representative of, um, of the contours there on the left. Um, so, so the upwelling induced biomass can actually exceed 60 kilotons, which is seen in 2002, which is the purple bar. Um, and you can see um, on the left, the, the purple 2002 contour um, is probably the largest extent over that region. Um, so for each of these events, the confluence zone was found to reside further south compared um, to other years, so closer to the North Kenya banks. So here you can see the year-to-year -year variability of the confluence zone. 
uh, which is shown here as the black line in each of these plots, um, but just for February. It shows that the confluence zone generally sits near the North Kenya banks during most years from about two to four degrees south with that one anomaly I mentioned earlier in 1998. Um, and you can also see that uh, this anomalous year aside, the mean sea surface temperature, primary production, uh, nutrients, which is here represented by dissolved inorganic nitrogen and um, integrated phytoplankton are all correlated to the position of the confluence zone. So when the confluence zone is positioned further south, the sea surface temperature is cooler over the North Kenya banks, while the primary production, dissolved inorganic nitrogen concentrations and phytoplankton are all larger, which shows that the position of the confluent zone exerts a major control on the upwelling and productivity over the North Kenya banks and is likely important for sustaining an offshore fishery. Thank you very much. I'll take any questions at the break. So thank you to Zoe for her presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the Q&A or the chat, or if you can um, raise your hand, that would be great. Right, Amani, I will jump in if there is no questions on the chat. Um, uh, Zoe, so... Um, you are a UK scientist um, previously to solstice working on the North Atlantic. So just a curious uh, question. What do you find the most challenging when you were, uh, let's say, thrown in to investigate something very different in a very different partnership? What was your thoughts about using quite an advanced global model for uh, this uh, issues? Um, good question. So, um, yeah, so previously I was working in the North Atlantic, which is obviously much better observed, much better studied. Um, so there's a lot more, um, a lot more out there in terms of understanding what's going on. So one of the biggest challenges was kind of, um, working in this region. It was, everything was kind of new. There wasn't much, um, already done. Um, I mean, we have no, well, very limited observational data to work with. So using a big um, global ocean model made it quite challenging to understand um, what's actually happening. So um, it would be really good in future um, if uh, projects could focus on working with local research partners to, um, to get some more observational data out there. Um, and ideally during the Northeast monsoon when this is actually uh, this event is actually happening, which will help going forward for um, understanding how it's going to change with climate change um, and getting some uh, getting some science into policy to get some suitable management options for this region. Thank you, Zoe. And I think we now have a question from the audience. Yes, so we've got a, a question from Melita. So she says, great talk, Zoe. And um, what happened in 2002 and 2009 to get the spikes in the phytoplankton? Um, so during, I didn't investigate e uh, individual years in, in, too, um, in too much detail, but what we do know is that during those particular years, the confluence zone was positioned further south of the North Kenya banks, which caused um, enhanced upwelling during these years. But I do appreciate 2002 was a particularly strong spike that was seen um, in remote sensing data as well. Um, and I know Fatma Jebri um, has worked on this a little bit as well. So some more work going into this would be interesting because, because 2002 in particular was quite, um, quite an obvious spike. So I don't know exactly what was happening in addition to the uh, confluent zone being further south. I don't know if Fatma has, if um, she wants to say anything on that one as well. Um, so yeah, actually 2002 was quite particular in terms of the monsoon variability. The monsoon wind variability was particularly strong in both the Southeast monsoon, but also the Northeast monsoon, which is when the North Kenyan bank upwelling is active. And as Zoe was saying, it's true. It was not necessarily investigated like with specific focus on what drives exactly the um, 
important uh, productivity of the North Kenyan ba uh, bank upwelling in 2002, but from our like remote sensing observation, it, we, we kind of like, um, or we think that there is also like a, a gyro or an eddy activity in place that could potentially enhance or emphasize um, the wide horizontal extension of the upwelling during 2002. I don't know, Zoe, if you agree. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, um, I can't see any more questions in the chat or the Q&A. So I think we will have a quick, um, just a five minute break before we go on to the next talks. Hi, welcome back everyone. Um, for our next presentation, we have um, a talk from uh, Katya Popova, um, which is about projected climate change impacts on marine ecosystems. Um, and that's followed uh, by a talk by uh, Savine Sealy um, about projected declines um, in marine fish biomass um, in the absence of climate mitigation. Um, I'll play those two uh, talks back to back, and then we'll have a chance for some questions after that um, um, on those two talks because they're, they're closely related. So hopefully everyone is back and I will just play the first video now. My name is Katya Popova, and this is a presentation on projected climate change impacts on marine ecosystem along the path of the East African coastal current. As we're all aware, human activities have increased the atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases and raised the Earth's average surface temperature by almost one degree centigrade since the start of the Industrial Revolution. So this slide shows key climate change impacts on marine ecosystems. Raising ocean temperature with associated marine heat waves, reduction in ocean productivity, change in ocean currents, increased ocean acidity, decline oxygen and raising sea levels. Although climate change is a global problem, its manifestation is always local and often unique. And this presentation is dedicated to the East African coastal current region, which is a relatively small region compared to global basin scale projections we usually give under IPCC scenarios. So when we use Earth climate models, they include not only ocean components, but all other components of the Earth system, atmosphere, cryosphere, land, and its ecosystem. And inevitably, we compromise on the resolution and complexity of each individual component. For example, in IPCC class models, ocean are usually resolved at one degree resolution, which you see on the very left of the plot, while on the right, you see ocean currents from a visa. Well, here you see much, uh, strong improvement of our reproduction of ocean circulation when we use one quarter degree resolution we used in this study, and even better and more energetic currents in one twelfth of the degree, which is not a resolution which is not yet achievable for future projections. 
So results I'm presenting here today in this presentation are described in the open access publication led by Zoe Jacobs on key climate change stresses of marine ecosystem along the past of the East African coastal current as a part of the special issue on ocean and coastal uh, management. So what is the most special about the region we're talking about? Its most special feature is seasonal reversibility of the monsoonal winds and ocean circulation. So during southwest monsoon, uh, from April to September, a wind direction is southwesterly, and the opposite one during the northeast monsoon, which blows from October to March. And interestingly, our paper shows that climate change response is also asymmetric in this case. And uh, key uh, climatic stresses are different from southeast and northeast monsoon. So the plot uh, below here shows wind speed anomalies. So what we see is a difference between uh, decadal average wind speed uh, between final decade of the century and the first decade of the century, essentially 1990s, and the same for the northeast monsoon. And so what we see is that during northeast monsoon, the wind speed is slowing down, while during the southeast monsoon, the wind speed is accelerating. So this diagram in the middle presents a summary of all responses during the southwest monsoon and northeast monsoon. But I will just would like to draw your attention to the key one. So during the southwest monsoon, uh, which is going to accelerate towards the, uh, toward the end of the century by about 6%, there is no response in primary production. There are lots of other factors which are cancelling each other and primary production remains nearly constant. And it's a very different situation during the northeast monsoon where wind stress is actually declining. So what's happening is that uh, mixed layer depths becoming more shallow, uh, East African coastal current upwelling uh, getting weaker, both factors are reducing nutrient supply to the upper layer, dissolved in organic nitrogen is declining by about 50% and primary production in this area is declining by about 30%. That's quite a strong decline. Another impact of climate change I would like to draw your attention to are marine heat waves. So as we know, in addition to the long-term and relatively slow progress of temperature rise, we have short-term localized extreme events called marine heat waves. Few recent marine heat waves were shown to have devastating economic impact on coastal communities. And these diagrams give you a good idea what these marine heat waves are. So you see those extreme events are becoming more frequent and then eventually they turn into one continuous marine heat waves with the progression of the climate change. So marine heat waves are periods when ocean temperature are anomalously warm for an extended period of time. And from numerical point of view, we calculate it as a time when SST exceeds the 90th percentile of the climatological period for more than five days. So the plot on the left here on the top gives a year, so it's colored by a year in which marine heat waves reach one year duration. So the whole thing becomes one continuous marine heat waves. And as you can see from this top, um, the onset of such long heat waves is not homogeneous. So some areas, in some areas, it's uh, going to occur sooner than in others. So, and along the Tanzanian and Kenyan coast, along our path of East African coastal current, we see that uh, they beginning to occur between 2035 and 2045. But there are areas when they occur as early, here for example, as early as uh, 2020s. So the plot below 
gives just an illustration what it's going to look like. So the plot below shows uh, SST uh, and on x-axis uh, is time in years. So you see the last decade of the previous century, they occurred very infrequent, infrequently and was relatively weak. So this plot shows uh, decade 2010 uh, with much more frequent marine heat waves. And this one is, for example, showing decade 2050 to 2060 when it goes almost continuously with, with very, very few interruptions. And the final decade of the century that heat waves are devastating, they go continuously. Uh, with sometimes temperature, extreme temperature difference reaching six degrees relative, the, relative to the climatological mean. So I'm coming to almost the end of my talk, and I here I just want to summarize the key climate change impacts on air marine ecosystems. So first of all, it's rising ocean temperature, which negatively impact marine organisms uh, living close to their thermal tolerances. So the next one is other side of rising ocean temperatures is marine heat waves, intense and short term events. Uh, corals are especially vulnerable to such events. So the next factor is reduced ocean mixing, which brings less nutrient to the ocean surface and ocean productivity will decline. The next one is uh, reduced oxygen, warmer water hold less oxygen and many types of fish and shellfish will struggle to survive in low oxygen conditions. A uh, change in uh, local currents. Uh, many animals rely on these currents to disperse eggs and, uh, eggs and larvae. Some others rely on them on food. Closely linked to ocean currents are uh, upwelling system, which supplies nutrients from deeper water, and climate change impacts upwelling regime, change in food availability for fish. Next climate change stressor are sea level rise uh, due to climate change leading to flooding and wave erosion along the coast, damaging mangrove forest and seagrass meadows. The next one is ocean acidification, increased carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, bringing ocean to a more acidic state. And the last one is a combined impact of all factors. When climate change impacts occur simultaneously, they can amplify each other, and this led to greater, greater negative impacts on marine ecosystems. So this brings me to the end of my talk, and I wanted to say thank you to my courses and to you listening today. Thank you. Hi everyone. So I'm going to follow on Katya's presentation in uh, which where she talked about uh, physical and biogeochemical stressors to move on to the climate change impact on fisheries as well as the impact of fishing itself for the fisheries of Kenya and Tanzania. This is work that was done in Solstice led by me and my colleague Robert Wilson from PML, as well as with contribution from several co-authors from the project. So first, as a bit of background, what is the impact of climate on fish itself? So this is a figure taken from a paper of, of, uh, from Lotse et al. Uh, 2019 looking at uh, the change in biomass and percent between end of 21st century and end of 20th century without any fishing pressure. So on the left, you have the result under RCP 2.6, which is a scenario with strong mitigation measure. And on the right, uh, RCP 8.5, which some calls the business as usual scenario. So we see the expected polar migration with a stronger decline in equatorial and tropical region, which reached 50% uh, 
under the RCP 8.5 scenario. And these are great results, but they don't quite delve into the details, what it means for local community and uh, what it means for some individual species. Is there's variation in those, it's just, um, um, so which is one of the goals I had for here. So we have the pole one migration and we have change, uh, climate change related to reduction in fish biomass and by extension, the potential catch. But is there an interaction between fishing and climate? Like we know that climate will have an impact, but what happens if we take into account fishing as well? What, uh, is there going to be an interaction or not? What could be the individual species response? Is, still, is it all the same for all species? And also is it all doom and gloom? Because saying that there is a uh, 50% reduction in biomass in an area is not quite uh, without providing any way to try and manage it or mitigate it is not quite uh, the right way to go at it. <clears throat> so to do this, uh, we used a modeling approach. So using the Nemo Medusa output to provide the climate forcing and also environmental until variable needed like temperature, primary production, pH, and salinity for the fish model SSTBM, which stands for size spectral dynamic bioclimate envelope model, which is a species specific fish model. So we're looking at individual fish species and there is a size spectral component for resource distribution. So based on primary production, how big, what would be the slope of the size spectra. And within the model, we can apply fishing as the maximum sustainable yield or MSY. The MSY is kept constant over the whole run period, but give an idea of what happened uh, when we include fishing into a climate run. So in, for more details, uh, so we have the scenario of climate change, which is RCP 8.5 from Nemo Medusa. And then on top of that, a number of fishing scenarios, fishing pressure scenario, which start with the MSY of zero, meaning there is no fishing. We are only busy seeing the impact of climate change. And from there, the MSY goes from one, which is uh, management at maximum sustainable yield, all the way up to four, which would include some highly destructive practice and overfishing, which is quite a high and um, unrealistic uh, bound, but which would help with setting boundaries. So we go from if in an environment where there is no fishing to one where there is highly uh, destructive fishing practices, what would happen in the system. And the model included 40 plus fish species that were selected as being representative or key for both commercial and sustainable uh, fisheries, trying to target as many groups as possible. So from there on, on to the results. So impact, what is the impact of climate change? Well, this is a figure showing that uh, the y-axis represents the percentage change in uh, the change in biomass, uh, comparing the 2000 to 2010 decade to the following years. Individual gray lines represent single fish species, while the red lines is for the mean biomass with the dashed line black line representing a no change case. So no surprise, uh, we have a decline in the majority of uh, species by the end of century. And the mean biomass is showing a decrease of over 50% uh, actually in this case. But we can also see that a few species are less sensitive to the impacts of climate than the over. And uh, that but this is a case with uh, absolutely no fishing happening on the impact of climate change. So what would happen if we were to include fishing? So here is the same kind of graph where you have uh, the clear line for the individual species and the darker line for the median change. And uh, Kenya on top, Tanzania on the bottom. We are going from the MSY0 to MSY4. And there are some differences that appear with the introduction of fishing, but there is no clear impact of fishing over climate, meaning that um, there is nothing in there that we can think is due to fishing only rather than climate being the main driver of the change. But fishing will have an impact on the speed uh, of change. So some things are going to change faster or sooner than they would have, and as well on the amplitude of said change. So the amplitude might be a bit less depending on the species. 
it is quite visible in this table. So you have uh, Kenya and Tanzania, and for both of them, we're providing the percentage of species that have uh, declining biomass of the run and the median change in species biomass. So you can see that you know, for each of the fishing scenario from MSY0 to MSY4. Um, as you can see, there's variation in it. And the interesting part is that as we increase fishing, it looks like there is less loss of biomass, but really what it is, is a redistribution of resources there as, as those fish species that have a higher biomass are fished out of the system more than the other ones. And the redistribution of the resource is going to allow some of the species that are just like in the no change area to maintain their biomass for a bit longer than if there was less fishing. So, but even then we have over 70% of species that are going to decline. And in Tanzania, that's a change uh, in biomass of uh, at least 50% and 60% in Kenya. So even for there is a variation depending on which MSY is applied, it's not, um, meaning that nothing is going to happen. <clears throat> and the last thing we looked at was the habitat as a factor, because since the different species are reacting differently, we tried to figure out what it was. And one of the main thing was whether they were pelagic or reef associated. So here in the figure, you have the different fishing scenario. And in red, the pelagic type of fish, while in blue are the reef associated one for the Kenyan area in solid line and dash for Tanzania. And you can see that the pelagic species have a stronger response than the reef associated one declining faster and stronger. And this is likely due to a number of factors, which are that pelagic habitat is going to change uh, faster. But also, uh, pelagic species, a lot of them are highly migratory. So that means that if the habitat is not suitable for them, whether it be temperature or productivity, they will not be present. So they will remove themselves from the environment much faster than, faster than the reef associated species. And also a caveat of the model is that the changes in reef habitat is not taken into account in the future. Meaning by that, that if there was a um, heat wave, and the corals were bleached and the reef does not recover, becoming more or less a dead zone. This, and meaning that the fish would be gone as well. This does not happen in the model. So they always have their habitat. So as long as the condition does not go to out of hand and there are still resources for them, they will be able to stay in the area. So this is to be taken with a grain of salt. So that's about it uh, for the results of um, the model. And as you can see, that's quite a lot, but really it comes falls on to two main conclusions. One is that climate change is a dominant factor, but with fishing exacerbating the climate effects. So under climate, the, the more fishing there is, the faster some of the change are likely to happen. However, it's all not doom and gloom because it's also so that careful management as in very responsive, likely um, more than responsive than the model was in terms of dominant species and their own bio recruitment on year on year, as well as uh, application of climate mitigation measure because climate is still the dominant driver here, could prevent fish biomass um, from decreasing and preserve the livelihood of the communities that are reliant on it. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll take questions now. Uh, thank you, Severine and Katya, for those interesting uh, results. Um, so I'll um, ask the attendees and the panelists if they have any questions. Um, otherwise, I'd like to start with a question um, for Severine. Uh, so from your work, it seems that pelagic species uh, are showing a stronger response to climate change effects, right? And are also uh, seen as highly migratory. So they can look for a more uh, suitable habitat and migrate out of the Kenyan and Tanzanian fishing zone. And that would impact the local communities. What potential measures do you think uh, could be put in place to mitigate this risk? Um... 
that's a tricky question in itself. And, and one of the main ones would be climate mitigations, because if we can keep uh, the areas there from warming and production to change too much, then the fish would stay there as long as it's within their uh, own tolerance. Mm -hmm. Then I think for the fisheries, it would be to try and have more surveys to estimate the stock biomass so that they can react uh, quickly to make sure it uh, stays sustainable and probably better gear because the more artisanal fisheries will not have the capacity to follow uh, the fish as they migrate north or south. They'll be quite limited in where they can go. So as uh, the populations are uh, moving away, the fishermen might not be able to follow unless it's like big commercial fleets. Yeah. Right. Um, well, I, I think this is like an important point and I hope this will be highlighted later in the science and to policy um, points, yeah. We have uh, another question in the chat. So from Melita, she's asking, or maybe it's a comment. She's saying, I think, uh, I think it's important to point out that the reef associated species were mainly the trivially, uh, which are semi-pelagic, i.e. less dem demersal than typical reef associated, uh, like snapper, emperor, grouper, etc. So we need to think about that. Fair. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the main focus was uh, largely on the pelagic species, but we had a few demersal and they probably didn't cover all the species that are of interest, but it's still going to show possibilities, I've, I think. Yeah. Um, okay, any other questions? Yes, yeah, Zoe, go ahead. I have a quick question for Sabrine. Um, so as we've seen for, uh, from the other presentations given in this webinar, um, especially for Kenya, the seasonality is quite important for this region in terms of productivity and especially going forward uh, with climate change. So just wondering if you had any feel for um, any kind of monsoonal or seasonal variability or have you just taken annual annual means as a whole and how you think that could be impacted? The model looks at the monthly means, but then the results are put out as annual um, outputs. So I have no feel for the impact of the monsoon seasonality. But I suspect that overall, as this change, it's going to make the environment less um, um, friendly for the fishes. And that's on an annual basis. So. Oh, it's so just a comment from Melita again. Melita is saying that she really like the paper and it leaves us with lots of questions on what to do. I do agree. <laughs> Thanks, Melita. <laughs> if I may add uh, an answer towards an answer to the first question of what mitigation uh, measures are possible, uh, just to draw attention that in the next webinar dedicated to Tanzania, our social economist Sarah Taylor was doing a study on uh, income diversification and in particular diversification or, for different fisheries, which is an expensive adaptation option, but it is an option uh, where you or fishers get access to a variety of the boats and variety of the fishing here to ensure to uh, diversify as much as, pos as possible uh, different groups of fish, which may start feeling impact of climate change in different times of uh, different strands. So just a bit of advert uh, for next week and also maybe ask for comments from our Kenyan colleagues what they think about such diversification. Is it achievable as a strategy, which obviously needs an investment, government investment? If Melita or Joseph can comment on it. Melita, can you comment? 
Joseph, what, what do you think about um, diversification of boats and the edges of diversifications of uh, fisheries as a strategy for adaptation? Yeah, uh, I, I don't know how, how best to answer the question because I, I, the diversification maybe would be, uh, sorry about the noise, I'm, I'm at home. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, about uh, sorry to interrupt a little bit. Uh, this is a little bit of technical maybe issues. Uh, Melita is saying that she's not sure how to put her microphone because she's just an attendee. Uh, okay. Go ahead, Joseph. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. But, uh, <clears throat> I, I think uh, when you talk about diversification, it is is in a scenario whereby uh, you have uh, a wide uh, field to choose from. But as it is for Kenya, uh, most of the fishery is 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 artisanal and 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 within an area that has already been uh, overly fished and 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 as well as uh, the pressures on the habitat, uh, you you find some bit of uh, habitat destruction. So uh, diversification, maybe when we start going out now with the North Kenya banks and 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 uh, we we the blue economy starts. Uh, 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 allowing people, I mean, people getting the interest to go out, then you can have diversification. But as of now, I, I, I don't know how best to answer that because there isn't much choice on the diversification to release stress, stress from an area so that we can, they can move to another area. But, but maybe the diversification will be to relieve stress from the already stressful situation in the near shore so that they can now go into the EEZ and the territorial waters. Maybe that could be an, an answer to diversification into the territorial waters and free the near shore areas. Thank you. Yeah, Joseph, thank you. You're absolutely right. Moving out onto the North Kenyan bank is a diversification away from the coral reef. No, you're absolutely right. It is, it is an adaptation strategy. So uh, Malika would like to speak so I can just allow her to, to talk rather than, than type. <laughs> On you go, Malika. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes we can. can. Yeah, oh, great. I just wasn't sure about that bit of technology. Um, and I don't have any great uh, answers. It's just such an interesting, we've heard some great talks and it, this is a very interesting topic that we're discussing right now um, and I, I think um, I would agree with Joseph we you know we've been talking for some time in Kenya about uh, encouraging fishers to go offshore and to access pelagic uh, fisheries um, as we've seen there's a lot of productivity on the North Kenya bank but it requires a lot more technology etc and, and that was made clear in his um, presentation and also in the video which I thought was terrific the a MOOC, the MOOC video. Um, but what we have to then think about is the what um, Severance just presented is the vulnerability of pelagic species to this change in productivity. Um, and I think we've seen that from the modeling as well from, from Fatma and Zoe and, and Katia's really nice presentation. It, it's a, you know, it's a complicated system. Um, and I, I would like to suggest that um, we don't necessarily see reefs as less susceptible to uh, um, which you might take as take as the take home message from um, the Wilson paper se that Pre Severin presented, um, because of course we know they're very susceptible to not only near shore pressure um, from our artisanal fisheries, but also of course from coral mortality and that's really clear and it's not looking like climate change is, is going away with the uh, some of the commitments that are being made right now. Um, and I, so I think we need to think in, in all spheres and the diversification, um, Joseph, I'm pretty sure this is a big move by the Kenyan government and we're developing some fleets uh, to go offshore into the EZ and I think that's right but we need to weigh that up with um, understanding the seasonality um, understanding what that future holds and actually thinking about the 
not the conflict, but the potential competition with industrial international fleets. So, I'd, you know, these are these are all a little bit beyond solstice, I think. But, um, you know, lots of discussions here that need to be had on um, managing the sort of the richness that we have, but the vulnerability uh, in our fisheries, both coastal and offshore. Uh, so I just want to say uh, no great question or answer, but um, really interesting talks and and i think uh, we're all really grateful to the solstice project um and to knox leadership on this you've been amazing really amazing thank you thanks Melita. thanks Melita. any other comments any other, comments? other questions, or questions? Um. Otherwise, uh, I think Amani, over to you, maybe for the next talk. So the next um, set of talks, there's three, um, are about the um, policy notes that were created um, for, uh, for Kenya um, as part of the Solstice project. They are available from our website um, alongside um, others for Tanzania. So I'll play three videos in a row again now, and then there'll be some time after that for further questions on those. As a result of a uh, research done for North Kenya and Bank during the Solstice project, we produced three documents, three summaries for policymakers related to the North Kenyan Bank management. So these three uh, documents are accelerating impact of climate change, what to be prepared for. Uh, second one is importance of ocean upwelling uh, for migratory fish species of the Western Indian Ocean. And the third one, North Kenyan bank upwelling and the need for risk-based approach to fisheries management. I will briefly cover the first of these uh, three documents and my colleagues from Comfrey, Kenyan Marine Fisheries Research Institute will cover second and third. So climate change impacts on Kenyan marine ecosystems, what to be prepared for. This summary for policymakers, first of all, draw attention to the urgency of the problem. And with regional specific uh, features, it mentioned marine heat waves uh, among the earliest signs of anthropogenic climate change, drawing attention to the fact that the first year-long marine heat wave may occur in Kenyan uh, waters as early as decade 2030s. Uh, the other important point this document makes uh, is drawing attention to a gap in our understanding of climate change impact in this particular region in uh, lack of knowledge on the system level responses, which take into consideration both physical drivers and human responses to it, and in particular responses, responses of fisheries uh, to the short-term and long-term events. And among key recommendations is to invest and grow into local capacity for data collection, ensuring that national climate change adaptation plans recognize the unique nature of the North Kenyan Bank as a prevailing system, uh, investing in operational early warning system for indications of periods of low marine species catch and development and or amendment on marine fisheries management plans to include risks associated with the climate change. So thank you and I will pass the microphone to my colleague from Comfrey. My name is uh, Joseph Kamau from Kenya Marine and Fisheries Research Institute. 
and I will be presenting on the importance of ocean aquarium at the North Kenya Banks for the migratory fish species of the Wea region. So the much of the work that has been done through Solstice has been uh, looking at the aquarium systems within within the East African region, and uh, our focus to Kenya is uh, the region up north. Uh, uh, in the area where the North Kenya Bank is. So the aquarium system with this, uh, in this uh, location is actually uh, triggered by the confluence when the Somali current uh, reverses and the East African, uh, and meets with the East African coastal current, uh, bringing in uh, cold nutrient rich waters into the surface and that's triggering the aquarium. Uh, as can be seen uh, on uh, the chlorophyll, uh, uh, model that shows the, 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 the signature of uh, upwelling of waters rich in nutrients and uh, the chlorophyll signature. So these are, this is what actually brings in uh, the support system and uh, causes high productivity and the fishery in that region. And uh, this region is quite uh, uh, known for its uh, uh, rich uh, tuna fishery as well as other uh, uh, other fishery species. Uh, apart from that, uh, the system is also uh, influenced by the accelerated currents during the southeast monsoon season, uh, when the Somali current uh, kind of uh, synergizes or uh, enhances the, the flow of the East African coastal current as it uh, uh, reverses towards the north and you have that coming in and, and, and of course, uh, the topographic forcing on uh, the North Kenya Bank that uh, causes some bit of perturbation and uh, upwelling uh, and uh, nutrients enhancement within that uh, season. So uh, as we, sorry, uh, as, as indicated before, this region is actually, uh, the, the region within the North Kenya Bank is actually, uh, 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 lies within the Chino migratory path, as can be seen from uh, the slide. Uh, and uh, the tuna actually migrates to Kenya in the month of July. And in the month of July, this is during the Southeast monsoon. And that's when we have a lot of tuna fishery within that location. And it can be, uh, it has actually been uh, documented by the number of fishing vessels that actually uh, are located within this region during the Southeast monsoon. It can be seen within uh, the, the plot uh, where it shows the red dots. The red dots is the position of the fishing vessel during the uh, Southeast monsoon. Most of the fishery is in that area, as well as uh, war, an occurrence of uh, sardine run that was observed in July uh, 2020 in the same area around Lamu. And uh, the sardine run actually is a support system that actually supports this fishery. Uh, they said the number of uh, uh, small pelagics is what supports this uh, system. Uh, and uh, as previously I had indicated, uh, this actually also is a pointer that uh, they are the elements of uh, the strong enhanced uh, East African coastal current having uh, uh, influence to uh, perturbation or uh, nutrients enhancement within this region uh, during the months of uh, July, that is during the Southeast monsoon. As work done even up, uh, within uh, Kenkri and uh, uh, during the, the Solstice project has actually revealed that uh, apart from uh, the region being uh, hosting the migratory fishery, it is also acting as, as, as a refuge for, or a nursery ground for, uh, as well as a breeding ground for, for this migratory fishery. We have been able to uh, document uh, tuna and tuna-like fishes, uh, uh, larval fishes, La fish larvae within this region, as can be seen in the plot, and you can see that uh, they are mostly uh, located around the North Kenya Bank. Uh, so this is a system apart from it uh, being within the migratory uh, tuna migratory region. 
it is also uh, a system that needs to be taken into consideration when you're looking at the commercial, uh, the overall management of the commercially important migratory species into the future. So it, it needs us to develop uh, tuna and tuna light species monitoring strategy. So there is a need of coming up with a strategy, a holistic strategy that is actually going to look into all these aspects, biological aspects, as well as uh, the system supports and as, and as well as uh, uh, looking at the trajectory into the future, uh, considering climate change. Because climate change is already altering marine ecosystems. Changes in intensity and timing of coastal upwelling will definitely impact migratory patterns, as well as recruitment, growth, distribution, and abundance, and uh, the relationship between uh, predator and prey uh, will also be affected. So having said that, uh, the North Kenya Bank ecosystem has a rich and diverse fishery, but it is not well harnessed, uh, and that is a, a, a something that needs to be looked into, especially when we want to uh, uh, harness the blue economy. Whereas information on fish productive zones can be available, they are like, they also lack really capacity to effectively take advantage of uh, the information, uh, requiring elaborate investment on uh, fishing capacity as well as uh, fish market in structure, the structure. So these are areas that needs to be considered when uh, uh, looking at uh, this fishery in totality so that uh, it can actually bear fruit uh, to the nation. So there are challenges and management target challenges is actually mainly, and this is, uh, there are many, but uh, this is a main, the main one, is the absence of a comprehensive management plan for the small and medium pelagic fishery. Uh, creates a key management obstacle in the endeavor to expand the fishery offshore. Thank you. My name is Damaris Mutia. Uh, I'll be presenting the key features of the North Kenya Banks of Kweli and I need for a risk-based approach to fisheries management. Uh, so the North Kenya Banks is a broader part of Kenya's continental shelf. Uh, this region is, the upper ocean circulation is influenced by the East African coast coastal current and the Somali current. So looking at the figures, uh, you see that during the Northeast monsoon, um, the East African coastal current meets the reversing Somali current and together they form a confluence, uh, which brings about the deep uh, rich waters to the surface, thus enhancing productivity. Uh, around this region. So the upwelling feature is dynamic. Uh, it's, it keeps on changing its strength, location, and spatial extent on an interannual time scale. So it's important to mention that Kenya lies within the tuna belt and is actually a member of the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. Um, having said that, uh, the North Kenya Bank region is projected to be significant in the management of commercially important migratory species. And this is because the region uh, contains important breeding and nursery grounds for these species. That is the tuna and tuna like species. So this actually calls for um, for development of a tuna and tuna like species monitoring strategy. It's also important to know that the EEZs of Kenya, Somalia, and Tanzania, and the high seas are highly connected in terms of circulation. And this puts Kenya's EEZ um, 
exposes the EE, Kenya's EEZ significantly, and thus we need fisheries management around these regions. So we, uh, we have a number of issues that present key management obstacles in the venture to expand the fisheries offshore. And these include the absence of a comprehensive management plan for the small and medium pelagic fishery, um, the lack of previous experience uh, of coping with strong seasonal in, and interannual variability in the key oceanographic features in the North Kenya Bank and, and the inadequate historical information uh, on the recruitment and retention of key commercial species. So this calls for development of fisheries management plans that consider the strong variability in the North Kenya Bank of Whaling and the associated productivity and uncertainty of how this feature is going to evolve with climate change. So we need a management plan that gives room for alterations as new information trickles in. And then we recommend the evaluation of the overall exposure of the fishery to climate stressors and expected in, impact. And here again, this needs to include information on the uncertainty in response of the North Kenya Bank of Whaling system um, in terms of the strength and its location as climate change progresses. We also recommend uh, to be recommend that to ensure adaptive capacity of the emerging fleet. Uh, and this is mainly because much of the fish is caught uh, during the southeast monsoon. Um, during this period, the seas are rough. So we need to have fleet that, that, that can actually respond to this natural variability and is able to minimize and cope and recover from the consequences. Again, we recommend that we strengthen expertise in operational remote sensing. Uh, this will ensure that uh, we employ the visibility of remote sensing data in guiding fishing fleets to locate fish schools uh, more efficiently. Then again, we need to develop risk-based management approaches. And basically, this is to cope with the good and the bad years. And again, to also protect our fish stocks from overfishing, especially during the bad years. Um, and again, to take care of all the key players so that their livelihoods are secured. So, with that, we say thank you. Uh, thanks for the presenters uh, for these um, interesting talks. Um, so now uh, we have room for discussion um, about those uh, policy relevant information. Um, let me check the, if there is like any comments or question in the chat or the Q&A. Um, I've just brought Damaris over from the um, attendees list, so she should be able to speak if there's any questions for right. Damaris now as well. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to remind everyone that those uh, policy documents are on the website, and um, so if you would like to read them, and the, uh, Katja put the link into the chat, so if you would like to read them, you can go there and see the full, the full documents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To start the discussion, I actually have a comment more than a question. Uh, so um, I noticed that several of the policy relevant information reported here are aligned with UN Ocean Decade uh, goals. And so uh, hopefully going forward, uh, the proposed management strategy will be put into effect more easily uh, being in this context of Ocean Decade.
Yes, thank you, Fatima. Yes, it's a very, very good comment. I'm kind of wondering, maybe Joseph can tell us uh, how alignment with ocean decayed uh, working uh, in this particular case. Is it helpful uh, for you to get the message and to get uh, an action going now with ocean's decay starting? Yes, uh, Katya, thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you for the presenters. I, I think we, we, we do have now a strong case to put forward and, uh, and, and uh, as well as uh, this give us impetus and, and a reason to, uh, to focus within an area that already has information that has uh, been derived by science. So, and, and uh, going by the fact that uh, it is productive and, uh, and, and it falls within uh, within all the parameters uh, that are, uh, where you can find that uh, tick, tick the boxes within. So, so I think we, we, we are in a good position. Yes, I'll say that and, and we'll further that. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Um, so in the Q&A, do we have any more questions? Questions? No. Okay. Um, well, if that's all, then I'll pass over to Katya from closing remarks. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Fatma, thank you very much for your chair in uh, QA. Uh, Amani, thank you very much for running the whole uh, show. Now we sorted out lots of technical issues. Uh, so sorry for uh, initial hiccups. Uh, now we are, I think we, we have a good experience. So next webinar in one week time uh, will go uh, smoothly. So just again, thank you so much for everyone, for your active participation, for questions, for discussions, both to uh, panel members and to participants. A uh, special thank you from us goes, of course, to Milita for keeping us uh, active and going. So next week, uh, just a bit of an advert, uh, next week uh, we will dedicate a webinar to the Tanzanian case study to the small pelagic fishery of the Pemba Channel. Again, we will try to keep the same uh, fast moving format. Uh, it will be a combination of short talks on research, on policy relevant issues with some of the MOOC lectures, one unusual feature for the next uh, webinar, we will launch our communication material. We produce lots of communication material uh, for solstice. Some of it is in a very unusual uh, format, uh, trying to target uh, uh, stakeholders which are not easy to reach. So just uh, to give you a bit of incentive to come up uh, in one week time. So yes, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and I wish you to have a good week and hopefully we will see you next week, next Monday. Thank you. <laughs>